also we have special guest from before uh, with another installment of his uh, research. We have Jaco Prinsloo from South Africa. Welcome to the show, Jaco. Good morning, Bonnie. Thank you very much for having me again. Well, thank you for joining us. Bless your heart. We are nine hours apart, so uh, the time zones are always very interesting. Um, uh, did you go to Sukkot, Jaco, there in, um, in in South Africa? No, Bonnie, we don't really have uh, lots of people around here that, that uh, keep Sukkot, but um, I believe Sukkot is, is basically every day, <laughs> you know, where, where the Lord lives with us since, we, since yeah. you know, he's, he's, come, he's uh-huh. come back to us. Uh-huh. Uh, right, well, yeah. uh, well, absolutely, absolutely. The feasts are a special time, um, you know, if you... Um, um you know uh, fr- fr- from your um from your tapes it, it, uh, you know you certainly are cognizant of the feast uh you know uh, are do you know anyone there in south africa who observes the feast passover sukkot um uh, you know shavuot i guess those are the main 3 Yes, there, there are there are many people that uh, do observe uh-huh. it. Um, I've even got a colleague at work that um, observed them, you know, religiously. Uh-huh. Uh, but uh-huh. I but I know I it's you know these are very special days on on God's calendar, and yes. you know, as I've shown yes. in my videos, the That's fact right. that He's marked it with special celestial signs and signals uh, yep. mark specific days with uh, where yes. He's got specific appointments with his nation and uh, you know we need to be aware of that and I think it's very important that we know when these when these times are and what to expect from them yes you know, I wonder it, if you have noticed uh, since the last time we talked with you uh, on YouTube how many people have jumped on your uh, end time uh, your, your roadmap to the end uh, on YouTube, there's people commenting on it all over the place, mostly favorable, I might say, by the way. Uh, uh, other people using the same software that you've been using, uh, what is it called, Stellarium, I think? Or? That's correct, yes. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and noting what you have already noted and, and, and published in your PDF book, um, I wonder if you've noticed how many people have, have jumped on that since we last talked to you. Yes, I, I did. And, and actually what was interesting is I saw some uh, other people that were that, that are involved with uh, Bible code research that have also done some studies on this. I don't know if you've if you've seen any yes, of this. Yes, I saw that. Yeah, yes. so and they... Oh, oh they, tell us, tell us about that, Jaco, tell yeah, us. Yeah, there was uh, a guy in Australia, I can't remember his name now, um, but now that you mentioned uh, people jumping on what we've done uh, on these videos, he is part of, uh, what's it, the code research, or what's it, uh, the Bible code research, uh, dot com or some, uh, some site like that, where mm-hmm. they specifically, you know, do Bible code research, and he saw my videos and decided to do a search on it, and I think the first term that he started with or started out with was uh, Jupiter and it only appears once apparently in the entire Tanakh and uh, the codes that he found in addition to to Jupiter in that specific search uh, area uh, basically said that uh, Jupiter will be broken up just as we've discovered the you know, no. the Bible explains to us so it, that that I thought was was very interesting and uh, you know to, to see that Bible codes even confirm what the Lord has shown me is, is really encouraging. You know, to know that it, you know it's a it's a real big event that that will happen uh, soon, and the fact that this has now been you know found in the Bible codes as well, confirming this this prophecy, yes. uh, is is really you know a confirmation of of what we look forward to in the years to come. Yes. His chart was very compact and full of references. It was uh, stunning. But the, the Bible code Jacob, guy. Who the, yeah, the Bible code guy? The Bible code chart. Okay. But, okay. Uh, Jacob, did did you f- notice or did did I miss it? I he didn't 
I don't know, he didn't say what passage in the Bible he was, he found all those references in. But it was very compact. It was all in one passage. I think it was, uh, it was somewhere in Chronicles or Samuel, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I think he <sighs> did write me an email explaining it to me. Um, I, I just, I, it slipped my mind now exactly which passage it, it came from. Um, I think oh, that's great have, to have yeah. your researchers <laughs> communicating on this. That's, yeah. that's wonderful. So, yeah, no, it's definitely interesting and to see how other people's findings also collaborate, you know, it's it's amazing how things are being put together and the the information that was hidden from from all the previous generations' eyes are now suddenly being revealed, which is, you know, just amazing. Did he find your name in the Bible code, Jaco? There's actually another guy that's he contacted me about two or three days ago that said he's found my name um, as well as Scotty Clark's name in a passage that uh-huh. re- that uh, means you know that involves the Revelation 12 sign. He hasn't sent it uh-huh. to me yet, so I'm uh-huh. eagerly awaiting to s- awaiting mm-hmm. his response to uh-huh. see exactly what it what it involves. Uh, Jaco, I have a question. Are you familiar with the book by Dr. Ernest L. Martin called The Star That Astonished the World, The Star of Bethlehem? Um, I'm f- familiar with uh, you know that that information. I haven't read his book specifically, uh, but there's mm-hmm. also the, a website called the Bethlehem Star, uh, dot com or something where all this information is uh, is presented. I'm not quite sure if it matches exactly what he has written in his book, but I'm, I'm quite familiar with that as well, yes. Yeah, I read the book back in 2002, and actually I've done quite a lot of research for the last, you know, 14 years on the Messiah's birth, Yes. and um, I did use Dr. Ernest L. Martin's book as part of my research, and um, and actually have written a book called When Was the Real Messiah Born and Why Does It Matter?, so yes, I do reference also uh, Revelation 12, and I'm sure you know this, but you you realize that the planet Jupiter was originally called by the ancient Hebrews Melchizedek. Yes, that's right, King of mm-hmm. Righteousness. Yes, <laughs> right, right. Yes, yeah, so um, it's definitely a subject that I'm very familiar with, and uh, so you're, what you're saying is that this alignment is supposed to take place again next year in well, 2017? It's actually a what? different alignment and it's the the one that's described in Revelation 12 obviously. So um, mm-hmm. and maybe just to come back to where this all began for me is you know I was always wondering what God meant by the seven thunders in uh, Revelation 10. Where mm-hmm. where John was told to seal up what the th- what the seven thunders were saying, so that mm-hmm. you know John knew what they were saying, but the rest or the reader of that information would never be in a position to know what what was said. So and that really intrigued me why God would really do something like that, and um, this led me down a path of discovery. Uh, and I'm always looking for patterns in the go- in in God's word to see you know where can I find answers to questions like these. And this triggered uh, the the fact that uh, Daniel was also told to seal up s- specific information, specifically mm-hmm. in Daniel 9 verse 24, where uh, mm-hmm. where Gabriel tells Daniel that. A specific prophecy and vision would be sealed up, you know. Or uh, if I can, maybe just mm-hmm. read read that passage. Let me just quickly find it. Um, so in Daniel 24, this it says, "70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation of iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness." and to seal up the vision and prophecy. And that's the specific vision and prophecy that um, God pointed me to. So, you know, our understanding then should be that when Gabriel told Daniel that a specific vision and prophecy would be sealed up, you know, by the time of the end, that should then be revealed, obviously. You know, if if, if he was told in Daniel 12 uh, to all that... This information is meant for the for the time when people will be running to and fro, 
and knowledge mm-hmm. would be increased. You know, so that specific uh, that is a specific attribute of of our, of the time that we live in, and it was certainly not an attribute of the time when John was writing Revelation. Many people say that you know the vision and the prophecy that was sealed up is, is basically Revelation that's been uh, provided at 90 AD. But if we, you know, so I went down a study with with uh, the specific vision and prophecy that was sealed up, and uh, I discovered that the Revelation 12 sign is, is the actual vision that forms part of this vision and prophecy that was sealed up, and the prophecy is the very first prophecy in the Bible that that we find in uh, Genesis 3 verse 14 to 19. We uh, just after Adam and Eve sinned, God gave that prophecy about you know what would happen to Satan, what would happen to the woman, what would happen to to Adam, and the woman that is presented there matches the exact same description as we see in the the vision that we find in Revelation 12, uh, where the you know this pregnancy is described. Um, we know that Revelation 12 is a celest- as a celestial application because through the software that we've got, we can see that there's a physical representation of you know planets, motions that that represent right. the birth of a of a, a child. The you know why don't we go to there? Why don't we go there, Jacob, and explain that in detail for the listeners so they can see? And this was pretty much part one of this study. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. So um, I basically covered why, the... Why don't we go back? We we didn't ta- discuss that last time, so why don't we start at the bottom <laughs> and in the basement and start <laughs> and build the house up. So what happens um, in the first part? What happens there? Tell her in, in detail, if you can paint a word picture for the listeners. Okay, I'll try my best. Um, I'm not that great at uh, doing it verbally but you know I, I think my abilities to do it when I write is a lot easier a lot better uh, but I'll try so what happens is that this specific alignment of stars uh, is, is very unique uh, it, there's, there's only two points in history where this occurred and the first happened uh, three, uh, in the year 3915 BC so before Christ um, this specific alignment, and uh, you know what this would mean to me is that God basically marked the same prophecy that was sealed up as the the vision that was sealed up. So both of them uh, are marked by the same celestial uh, marker. And what happens in this alignment is that you have uh, the constellation Virgo underneath Leo. Um, Leo consists of nine stars, uh, and it's above the head of Virgo. And what happens then is that um, once once a year the the sun is basically in front of Virgo, so it would look like um, Virgo is clothed with the sun. Uh, there are a number of stars at her head then, which which are made up of uh, the stars within the Leo constellation. And then uh, okay, and just 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 for a minute, okay, uh, Virgo is the Virgin, is Betula. Uh, and Leo is Leo is is Ariel is uh, Judah. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, all righty. So this. Sorry. Um, you've got the sun clothing the the Virgo constellation once a year, and this happens around August to October. Uh, but then, the fact that Revelation 12 mentions you know the, this woman having a, a crown of 12 stars at her head, as well as the moon at her feet, and in uh, Considering the the pregnancy that she would have gone through, uh, having a, a specific planet within her womb for a period of nine months, is something that only occurs twice. Like I said, on the history of our you know known within our known history. Uh, okay, so in in this uh, a planetary alignment, when you have Betula under uh, Ariel under the lion, uh, there uh, Jupiter passes from Ariel to. Betula to Virgo to the Virgin is that correct? That's correct. Yes, and for the specific upcoming al- alignment that will uh, complete, or it actually starts on November twentieth um, this year. We okay. Wait. This 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 passage uh, from Ju- of Jupiter from Ariel to uh, Betula happens on November of this year. 
Well, it en- Jupiter enters the womb of the Virgin, or Virgo, or Betula, in, uh, on November 20th, according to the Stellarium software that we, that we use. So it's, that's the time when, the, you know, when that line is crossed, uh, and we can then say that Jupiter has entered the womb of the Virgo constellation. And then, as a, as a result of a retrograde motion, which only happens, you know... What is retrograde? This is the view that we have of a planet um, from our, you know, relative position around the sun. So that, you know, when we orbit the sun, or when the Earth orbits the sun, um, we have a specific uh, perspective of the planets around us, uh, because they are also orbiting the sun, and, and uh, when we are moving in one direction and then suddenly s- starting to turn around in another direction, it would seem that the other planets are making, uh, you know, you know it, they regress in the the path that we see them moving. You know, so it would look like Jupiter is moving backwards instead of moving forwards. You know, that would be the the regression that uh, that is mentioned. So what happens with this pregnancy is that Jupiter goes into the womb of Virgo and normally. It would just pass through within uh, about three or four months, but because of this retrograde motion that occurs when it enters the womb, it remains in the womb of Virgo for nine months, um, and it's I think 41 days and uh, 41 weeks and six days, which is sort of the, uh, the longer uh, pregnancy period of a or a, a, a lengthy pregnancy period, uh, which is about 42 weeks, uh, but it's still within normal. Uh, the normal expected time for a a pregnancy. I was told with my first child that the normal first child term is not 40 weeks, it is 41 weeks. So I wonder if this is this is um, an argument in favor that this shows that this is a first uh, a, a first pregnancy of Virgo that it's that it's forty one weeks instead of forty. I, I'm not a physician. My husband is not a gynecologist. He's an ophthalmologist. Uh, but um, you know, uh, uh, that just occurs to me when you're talking because that's what the doctor told me. Yeah. I don't know. There's another mom here, Maria. Well, well yeah, I, w- I want to say parents. something about that because in my research about yeah. when uh, Messiah was born. Um, by Dr. Ernest Del Martin. I told you he wrote the book called The Star That Astonished the World. One of the things that he found, and it was confirmed by the Bible codes as well, that Miriam, or Mary, you know, her Hebrew name was Miriam, of course, but um, when the angel Gabriel appeared to her and told her that she was going to conceive, that that happened on Hanukkah. And it actually was exactly 271 days, which that would be... Um, I don't know how many weeks that would be exactly. I think two. Um, let me see, 271 days uh, divided by seven would be what? I don't know. I'm not looking. I don't have my calculator up here. But um, basically, it was 271 days. It's, it's short of 40 weeks because uh, 40 weeks would be 280. Yeah, that's 38.7. Now, I, know, <laughs> I know the traditional uh, messianic. Um, idea is that he was born on Sukkot. Mm-hmm. However, Dr. Ernest Martin shows with uh, a lot of evidence that he was born on the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Teruah, and I kind of grappled with that for several years, and I, in my book I explain why I believe he was born on the Yom Teruah versus Sukkot, because I believe he actually fulfilled all three of the fall feasts during yeah. the, the period of his nativity. Um, just like he fulfilled all three of the spring feasts for his death, burial, and resurrection, right? So, um, okay, here we are at the break, folks. Stay with us. Welcome back, everyone, to the second half hour of we have Jaco Prinsloo here and Maria and Ron. It is a a, a p- packed a Thursday morning. Okay, you know, uh, Ron. <laughs> there we go. Uh, we were um, we were we were discussing the fact that Jupiter is retrograde. Our our view of it. So instead of Jupiter passing through the womb of Virgo, Betula, the Virgin, uh, it stays there. It, it would normally pass through three to four months. 
However, because of our view, what happens? Um, it's like I said, it stays. Jupiter stays within the womb of Virgo for, in this case, 41 weeks and six days. Uh, the previous occasion where this happened in 3915 BC, it stayed there for nine months as well. Uh, it's, it was a bit shorter than um, this time around, but it was also a nine-month uh, pregnancy that was represented. And in what happens during the pregnancy is that there are three stars that move in uh, in conjunction with one of the the feet of uh, or the uh, one of the feet of the constellation of Leo. Um, and this is uh, in 3915 BC it was uh, Saturn, Venus and Mercury and in this occasion we've got uh, Venus, Mars and Mercury uh, that complete the the 12 star crown on top of the, the woman's head and then the final thing to, to, to complete the alignment is that the moon then comes down to the feet of the, the Virgo constellation for a very short specific time we, we can then say uh, the moon is under the feet of the woman, uh, which then completes the, the Revelation 12 sign, which is very unique and you know, only, uh, has only occurred twice, and <coughs> it matches the, the time periods for the prophecy and the vision that Daniel was, was told would be sealed up. Now, what That's quite the, the, amazing. The three stars, is that the very, very bright star that was mentioned at Yeshua's birth uh, by even uh, secular contemporaneous writers? Is, is that the same? Are we going to see that bright star again? I'm not sure, uh, Bonnie. I'm not sure exactly what the, the wise men saw when Jesus was born. I know there are some conjectures about uh, you know Jupiter and Regulus combining uh, and there are a number of, of views on this, but you know what exactly it was, whether it was a comet or something else that they saw, I'm not quite sure. Uh, I haven't found anything that I could say with, you know, with absolute certainty this was what they saw and this was what uh, pointed them to the birth. Uh, I'm not sure, but uh, it could be, it could be, but I don't think we will see any of that at this point um, except for the the unknown planet that that we know will uh, at the birth of Jupiter from the Virgo constellation next year the uh, you know what we understand from God's word is that there will be a collision between Jupiter and this unknown planet okay t tell us about the unknown planet um, we know that when Jesus was crucified, or actually I should maybe start with what, uh, how God marks his appointed times. And we find that in Genesis 1 verse 14 where he assigns the, the purpose of the created lights in the heavens to, to be for signs and for seasons uh, primarily. And then also to point out days and years if we, if we read the... Uh, the order in which this is given in that specific verse. So the primary purpose is to act as signals to mark God's appointed times and then secondly for identifying days and or marking days and years, I guess. And if we then look... That, that is amazing because right now it's the opposite. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's for signs and signals. Oh yeah, by the way, it marks time. Yeah. And right now... We've completely, as a as a culture, as a global culture, uh, we uh, ignore the fact that the signs and signals are being trumpeted from the sky, uh, and it's just marking time. Interesting the way that has flip flopped. That is correct. And if we then look at uh, Le Leviticus 23, where the specific feast days of the Lord is described, we find seven of them: um, <coughs> Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits. Uh, Pentecost or Shavuot, uh, Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, and uh, Feast of Tabernacles. And when we look at how, you know, when I studied this, uh, I know that God said in Genesis that he would mark his feast days, and he's given, his, uh, given us his feast days in Leviticus 23. And then I studied the events around Jesus' crucifixion to see if I could find anything where he marked one of these days, or how did he mark these specific feast days that, that are called the, the spring feasts? 
And it is quite interesting that on, on Passover we read that there was a, a three-hour solar eclipse when Jesus hung on the cross, and there was darkness over the land, and this was not only recorded by, uh, you know, it was not only recorded in the Bible, but there were actually four other writers, two of them, or two of those that were secular writers that also recorded this event as, you know, very unique, um, the largest eclipse of the of the sun that ever occurred. And what makes this even more uh, uh, unique is the fact that 18 hours earlier, if we look at the, the calendar um, on, on TorahCalendar.com, we see that 18 hours earlier there, were a, or there was a, a lunar eclipse. So that excludes the, the moon from being able to cause a, an eclipse of the sun. And this then uh, led me to look into this and... Uh, this shows us that there's another planetary body out there that uh, we don't know of or that uh, you know most people are not aware of uh, which moved between the sun and the earth during the time of Jesus crucifixion and it is large what, enough to what, sorry go ahead what is the lo- what is the longest uh, normal eclipse of the sun the moon can only eclipse the sun for 7 minutes and 29 seconds that's the longest eclipse that it could cause so to have a three hour eclipse of the sun means that we have a a very large or a massive uh, celestial entity moving between the earth and the sun and the fact that nobody saw it when it happened um, I know that NASA found a a rogue entity around 1983 with their uh, IRAS satellite uh, or, or a telescope on that satellite which they said, you know, they didn't know exactly what it was, if it's a a planet or a celestial system or a comet, but it was apparently shrouded in a lot of dust. Um, It was extremely cold, and uh, I think it was, they said it was something like uh, only 40 degrees above absolute zero, which means that, you know, even with, or you need a, a infrared telescope to actually see this thing. And at that point, they estimated the distance from the sun to be about fifty uh, five zero billion uh, miles, which is really far away. And then we didn't hear anything after that until 1992, when there was another uh, news release by NASA, who said that uh, you know the distance was at that point seven billion miles. So there's definitely a decrease in the distance between those two time periods um, and these descriptions at least matches what we would expect people to have experienced when they saw the um, you know the darkness over the earth they they saw this darkness coming over the earth but they couldn't see a planet and that's because of the the dust shroud um, which prevented light from being reflected from this object so it wouldn't be uh, similar to the moon, when we look at the moon during the daytime, you can see it reflecting the light of the sun. Uh, the it, 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 in in eighty three, it was fifty billion away, and That's when correct. was it seven billion? Nineteen ninety two. 92, Okay, so that's less than ten years. It traveled. Uh, I mean, what? Um, uh, yeah, from 50 to, to uh, 7, right, so that's about 43, miles? 43 billion miles it covered, yeah. Jacko, did you not say uh, that they uh, that 1992 news release had disappeared from the files of NASA? Yes, it, it, uh, it's no longer um, shown on their website, uh, and they've got a, a little... Uh, disclaimer there saying that there are some articles missing from the period between 91 and 94 or something, I can't remember exact, the exact dates uh, mm-hmm. but the, the the article ostensibly links to the or the website links to the article but they're not displayed on the website so, um, you know, it would it makes one wonder why they haven't corrected this yet uh, the, the disclaimer is still there uh, and I'm sure it shouldn't be too difficult to get the information back onto the website if they really wanted to. <laughs> yes, maybe NASA, uh, maybe NSA could help NASA yeah. find the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe Hillary has it among her. her email. Probably has it on her cell phone. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> you know, to to go forty three billion miles though in nine years, uh, that's I mean it must be really close. This is I'm, I mean ninety two. That's a long time ago. I mean it must be at our doorstep by now. Yeah, correct. And I'm not sure whether the fifty billion miles was an accurate. Right, uh, right, you know, right. I don't. I mean. It would have it would have passed us long ago. Yeah, so um, it might I have remember been actually. Sorry. Uh huh. I remember when that announcement came out. We have another. Uh, we have another uh, planet, uh, folks. I remember when that come c- came out in '83, and and I'm thinking, oh, you know what? Hey, they're always. Uh, t- I didn't. I didn't pay it any heed, but I remember, and I remember other articles. In fact, you know there are a lot of other articles in the 80s. Toward the end of the 80s, nothing. And yeah. by 93, the guy that you know first came out with it, I think was Harrington was his name, and uh, and and he later, you know, um, you know, died prematurely. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I understood that it was a one-car accident in the desert, and his papers were missing. But, you know, I've since read other things. But there is nothing about that. But, you know, we'll, we certainly see that the, um, uh, you know, there is certainly a lot of interest right now in um, in, in building underground bunkers. That's correct. Yes, and it's all in done fact, secretively. You, you know, there's no. That's right. There's no That's focus it. on it. There's, you know, everything is done in secret. And you know, if you didn't read the uh, the alternative news, nobody would really know that there are uh, no, you know, deep no. underground military bunkers. Absolutely, and they're being, you know, I've tried to get. I mean, you know, I store stuff. I mean, I <laughs> if if you're not, you know, I don't know, but anyway, I do. I store stuff, and I've tried to get uh, canned butter. The uh, DHS, Department of Homeland Security, buys it all. Mm. If there is a shipment of canned butter, they buy it all. Anyway, they are, um, uh, uh, you know, these amazing, I mean, truckloads and truckloads. Some of these uh, long-term storage uh, food companies, uh, they say they're booked out for the next year. Don't even contact them. All they're doing is serving governmental entities with truckloads. Of of uh, for, of um, uh, long term food. Uh, okay, let me see. So anyway, this thing is coming in. Uh, if it were, and again, these numbers are you know fudgy, but nonetheless, it shows a great. Um, uh, it's coming toward us at a rapid speed, and my goodness, it should it should just about be here. Of course, we're t- being told nothing. That's um, right. Okay, what's the name of this um, incoming uh, a body? What do you think it is, Jaco? Do you, th- you think you think it's a? Well, people call it Nemesis, or they call it Planet X, or they call it Nibiru. Um, if we go on what we read in the Word, where the the red dragon in Revelation 12 is described, it would stand to reason that it might be a uh, a system where the dragon has got seven heads and ten crowns on, on the heads, you know, that would represent maybe a some sort of a star which rep- represents the, the dragon with uh, seven heads, which could be planets orbiting it, and the ten crowns could be moons orbiting the planets. You know, that would be a one one way to look at it. Uh, whether this is true or not, that it's, co- it's just conjecture at this point. But, uh, you know... Some photographs uh, of, of this thing, and there are people on YouTube that, it, we, in fact, we heard from one, uh, Dill Martin, the other the other week. We heard from him. All he did was post um, uh, uh, p- photographs sent to him from various parts of the world of this. It's not just one, but it is a system coming in, mm. a system, and you can see them. That's correct. So... Uh, and then we also yeah. we also read of one of the heads that will be you know of this dragon that will be wounded, and mm-hmm. we also you know knowing now that we have a prophecy and a vision that are talking about the same uh, situation, uh, we know that Genesis three verse fifteen describes the uh, 
you know, the interaction that will take place where we read, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. So when we read um, her seed, we know this refers to, to Jupiter and thy seed is the, you know, some planet around this other system that will come in contact with, with Jupiter. And then it <coughs> says, it, it shall bruise thy head and, it, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Which is a okay. Let yeah. Let's let's okay. Let's go back to okay. When uh, this this process of <coughs> conception of uh, uh, Jupiter or a medic um, uh, you know, this process is complete November twentieth of two thousand sixteen. That is oh my goodness. That's only I don't know. That's less than a month away. Yeah, twenty three days. Oh, twenty four yes, days. Yeah. Okay, uh, so, uh, you know, c can you tell he's an engineer? <laughs> 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 he's got all the numbers there. Um, you know, I I was humanities based. It takes me a minute to add two and two. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so c c conception um, occurs November twentieth of this year when Jupiter Melchizedek enters the womb of Virgo, and stays there. An astonishing. Uh, 41 weeks and 6 days. That's correct, yes. And, and it stays in the womb of Virgo. And, and this, uh, th uh, that's amazing to me. And then um, when it is, uh, when does Vir Virgo or Virgin or Betula, when does she give birth to Melchizedek? That happens on uh, September 9th of 2017. And that is two weeks or exactly two weeks before the final alignment as described in uh, Revelation 12 verse 1. Um, okay. Okay, so, so, so let's 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 jump forward to uh you know what this is almost November. Let's go forward, you know, a little a little more than 10 months when this uh when when Melik Zedek will be born uh to September 9, 2017. What do we see then, Jacob? Well, what we read in Revelation 12 is that um uh -huh. the when the woman uh, well, she will be travailing in birth, and this woman has a has symbolism surrounding her that identifies Israel. So we know the you know, the reference to the moon, the sun, and the twelve stars uh, are found in the dream of Joseph, where he describes his brothers as the eleven stars, with him being the twelfth, and in the moon and the star, uh, the moon and the sun being his uh, father and mother, which then identifies the woman that's being spoken of in Revelation 12, in my opinion at least, as um, the nation Israel. So there will be, in my opinion, uh, a specific event that would start a travailing process for the nation Israel um, that would most likely occur uh, at the end of November, or you know, around the 20th, when this conception takes place. And if we consider some of the passages that we find in in Matthew and Luke where Jesus' disciples or Yeshua's disciples uh, came to him and asked him about the end times he gave specific information that uh, covers the period that leads up to the beginning of the, the end time or Daniel's 70th week um, but before that happens at the time of the birth uh, this is when we read in Revelation 12 that the, the dragon would would try to devour the child. Um, let me just quickly find it here. Um, so in Revelation 12 verse 4 we read, And his tail drew the third part of the stars of the heaven, and did cast him to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered. So that would be right at the point of birth, for to devour a child as soon as it was born. And that then links back to the prophecy in Genesis 3, where we see this uh, bruising of the head and the heel that occurs at the time of the, the birth of Jupiter from, from the Virgo constellation. So here we have, uh, do, you, do you, I mean, there is a principle, what you see in the natural has a spiritual application, uh, what, would you, what you see in the, and vice versa, what you see in the spiritual has a natural application. So, you know, when, when you see uh, the, 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 the nation of Israel being born, uh, will there be great um, uh, adversity against her, the, the new nation of Israel? 
I think we read uh, in one passage that uh, Israel was brought, uh, brought forth in one day uh, before the travails started, which um, this happened in 1948. Uh, so the, yeah. that, that process yeah. did not really involve any mm-hmm. travailing, except if we consider what happened during World War II. Uh, obviously, <laughs> Nice, uh, you know, th- but there was no sign in the heaven that matched uh, what we see before us now, uh, and I think that passage, I think it's in Isaiah, Isaiah somewhere. Um, yes, where it says Isaiah that sixty-six. That's Isaiah right. Yes, 66. Bef- before the, uh, she travailed, she brought forth the nation, and uh, who has ever seen this happen before, etc. Um, yeah. But that specifically points to Israel being reborn as a nation in 1948 which happened on the you know one day they became a nation again and this occurred before the travailing process which is now before us and I think there will be specific events that we find described within Matthew and Luke and Mark um, that reference what we could expect to see happening um, in the the months coming during this pregnancy period or this uh, celestial pregnancy. Can I interject something here? I, you know, um, when we look at this prophecy in Revelation 12, the woman, of course you said it's Israel, and I agree, more specifically it's Jerusalem, because Paul the Apostle, Shaul, says in Galatians 4.26, Jerusalem is the mother of us all. Right. Yeah, correct. In other words, Jerusalem's the mother of Christianity and Judaism, right? Yes. So, so I see this prophecy as a twofold application. The woman initially was Miriam giving birth to the Messiah, but in the future, the woman is Jerusalem giving birth to the one new man. Remember in Ephesians chapter 2, the Apostle Shoal says that Messiah has made both, meaning Jew and Gentile, yeah. both houses of Israel, Ephraim and Judah, one new man. So when Jerusalem gives birth to the one new man, right now there's a lot of talk in Israel about allowing Ephraim to come back. And up until this point, the house of Judah has not been willing to allow Ephraim, Ephraim to come back mm. to the land, but it's they're talking about it now. They're they're opening dialogue about it and saying we're going to invite the other ten tribes back. That's so, interesting, Maria. That ties to the uh, the male child, uh, the one new man. That that kind of links as well. Yeah, right. I, 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 I agree too. That's why I was going here. You know, I think that this. Uh, excuse us just for a minute, Jacob, while we address our no problem. Our, 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 our Hebrew roots. You know, I, I think this is the um, uh, the travail of the birth of, of, you know, the one new man or greater Israel or, you know, the two sticks coming together. But this is certainly encompassing all of that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, we're finished, Jaco. Thank you so much. <laughs> no, no problem. Jaco, I have a question for you, because I, I, if I recall correctly, this uh, mystery planet is approaching our solar system from below the ecliptic, which would be uh, referred to the southern hemisphere of our Earth. Um, and did you not tell us that six nations have established Observatory. Uh, oh, we've yeah, got a, we got a hey, long break. Ron, Ron uh, uh, hold that question and bring us back with that question, would you please? You bet. Okay. Well, uh, join us on the other side. <laughs> okay, and welcome back to this Thursday morning of Wake Up. And we're playing a four-handed game today with uh, my <laughs> co-host, Bonnie Harvey, and guest co-host, Maria Marola, and with us from South Africa is Jacob Prinslow, uh, and we have been reviewing some of the things that he has discovered, and it's in his uh, PDF book, God's Roadmap to the End. Just before we go back to Jacob, and I have a, bur- a question burning in my mind for Jacob, but I wanted to alert our listeners to the fact that this afternoon at 1 p.m. Pacific Time, uh, begins a conference from Koinonia House, uh, Chuck Missler's place, and it's going to be online. It's it's a streaming conference, and it's going to continue right through to the end of 
uh, end of Shabbat, um, you can enroll for this thing with a one-month membership for twenty bucks, and that will allow you to not only to view the uh, the conference events live, but also to go back and within the the thirty days you can view the various segments uh, in the archives. And the speaker, the the array of speakers is pretty impressive. Uh, we have Chuck Missler himself, uh, Joe Farah, who is the founder and, and president of WorldNet Daily, Joel Richardson, a very well-known author, uh, William Federer, Peter Flint, who is the, uh, the chair, the Canadian chair of um, the Dead Sea Scrolls Research, and he's with the Dead Sea Scrolls Institute at Trinity Western University. Uh, Scott Carroll, Paul McGuire, William Wilty, Jay Siegert, L.A. Marzulli, whose people on this program will be familiar with L.A., uh, Bob Cornick, who's uh, an archaeologist and has written several books, Bill Salas, who's a, an end times prophecy authority, and, and many, many more. So uh, I accessed this thing through WorldNet Daily at WND.com, and I just wanted to alert the, the listeners to that so that they will be able to if they want to, to get on board with this thing. Now Jaco, to turn to the things that we were talking about uh, signs in the sky and signs in the heavens and and this mysterious planet that some people call Planet X or uh, Nibiru um, I think that I recall that you told us that that, that B- giant gas planet is which will be reddish because or can only be seen by infrared telescopes that it is approaching the solar system uh, from below the ecliptic which would mean that the southern hemisphere of our planet where you are uh, would have a better view of its approach but did you not also tell us that uh, several nations have established observatories in Antarctica, at the very southern tip of our planet. Yeah, that's right, Ron. Um, Australia, China, France, Italy, Japan, and the USA are all... I'm not sure if there are any others, but those are the, the ones that we know have set up infrared telescopes in Antarctica. Um, they are infrared telescopes. Yeah, specifically because, uh, you know, this planet can uh, cannot be viewed with optical telescopes. So, um, right. quite interesting. That, that is, and, and also, I think the, um, uh, the Vatican Observatory yeah. that is called Lucifer is a, an infrared telescope too, isn't it? Yeah. They're all right. infrareds. Uh, wow. Have you seen? Have you seen the big array in uh, Australia of um, array uh, uh, an array of infrared radio telescopes? Yes, they've actually uh, established uh, an array here in South Africa as well, which which is also quite interesting. And I know there was some uh, uh, competition between who would get it. You know, is it South Africa? Is it, or was it going to be Australia? And in the end, uh, we at least got mm-hmm. some of it. Um, but I suppose the the idea of having this satellite uh, or obs- observatory uh, would would also be quite interesting to see what what comes from it. There has been a a, a decided interest a, a, a revival of infrared telescopes in the southern hemisphere, uh, point n- not only in the southern hemisphere but pointing. South, and they have that huge base uh, on uh, Antarctica uh, 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 that is manned by. Uh, uh, it's a joint effort by many countries. Yeah, uh, so right. anyway, as a result of this, so this is like Tom Horn and and Gar- and Putnam. You know, they're big. They've written several books on this. Um, they they have been up to that. <clears throat> um, Vatican infrared telescope in it's either New Mexico or Arizona, um, but uh, but uh, uh, there is a strong global interest uh, in infrared, which is you know all you can see really. I don't know if you can see anything else, but you can see the heat signatures. That's that's the beauty of infrared. 
you can't see what you see. You can see the heat. That's good. Um, and um, and uh, other than uh, going into uh, something like a neutron star, which I think this is, um, you know, I, I don't know if infrared would be of much help. Uh, but there, you can tell that they're looking for something very specific that is not normally sighted. And there is a great interest with all of these arrays being built. You know, if you haven't seen this array, I mean, it goes, it goes in the Australian desert uh, for ever. My goodness, uh, it, there are many, many, many. And why radio? That's kind of freaky. But anyway, uh, great interest, infrared, uh, the heat signatures as a result of this 1983, or you know, at least apparent result. Uh, of the 1983 discovery by Harrington, who actually, I think, worked for NASA. Yeah, that's um, right. Uh, which, you know, some people say is never a straight answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and he was eventually, he died prematurely, uh, that's all I'll say, under, I met many people quarrel his death. So, um, okay, let me see. It's, it's coming from the south. Uh, we have it born uh, next September 9, 2017. Now, you say two weeks later, the constellation, this alignment is in its final phase. Well, what does that mean, Jacob? Would you explain that? Well, that would be the time, you know, when the birth takes place. The moon is not yet in the right location as described uh, within Revelation 12. So in Revelation 12, it says, you know, there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, uh, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. So the final alignment that uh, is reached um, at the specific time when Israel would be looking up into the sky to spot the first sliver of the, the moon, yeah, that's normally the way that they would determine the start of the new year, uh, and that would be, uh, that would then also assign the the date of Tishri 1, uh, when the two witnesses went to the Sanhedrin to uh, witness to the, uh, or testify to the Sanhedrin about the fact that they spotted the, uh, the new moon in the sky, uh, or the first sliver of the new moon, after the new moon, uh, and this would normally happen in a time frame between, I would say, about 6.30 at night and about... Uh, 7.30 at night, so sort of when it's uh, dawn, uh, dusk, I mean, uh, just after sunset, that would be the, the time during which this would normally happen, because when the sun is up, it would be really difficult to see the first sliver of the moon, as it's such a, a faint uh, light that you, you really need the sun to be under the horizon to, to spot that. And what is really interesting about this is the way in which the, the same pattern that was used to mark the or signal the completion of the first feast day, um, which is Passover, that was completed when, or that was fulfilled when Jesus was crucified, um, where we saw this uh, three hour eclipse uh, of the sun marking the completion of that feast day. The same pattern is then being repeated for the four feasts, where we see this sign of Revelation 12 uh, marking the completion of the, the Feast of Trumpets, or Yom Teruah which I, I was just fascinated when I, when I saw that, you know, to see that the same pattern that, that was, was used during the first feast uh, season is being repeated during the second se uh, feast season. And, you know, it, it so, matches so it down. Nine, uh, sorry? No, September 9 of next year is Yom Teruah, Feast of Trumpets, no, no, correct? It, no, it's September 23rd. September oh, nine, I see. yeah. September nine is the birth of Jupiter, and then there's a two-week period, similar to when Jesus walked around on the earth for, for 40 days after his uh, resurrection. Um, you know, the same would then, you know, the birth would take place from the Virgo constellation. Then there's a two-week period um, that that'll pass during which I would think the fearful sights and heavenly signs that would be shown to those on the earth would occur up to the point where the Feast of Trumpets would be uh, fulfilled on September 23rd. Well, Jacob, when is the uh, projected near collision or collision between Nibiru and Jupiter? Well, if we, from what I understand, 
by reading Revelation 12 and Genesis 3, uh, this would occur when the child is about to be born from Virgo. Um, so that would set the date around September 9th of 2017. That would be the birth of Jupiter. And this is when the seed of the serpent will bruise the heel of uh, the, wom- uh, the, the seed of the woman. Uh, and mm-hmm. that would be the this encounter that's described, which then would also result in the fearful sights in the heaven and uh, great heavenly signs that, that are mentioned in Luke 21. All right. Now, if, if that creates then a, a trail of debris behind Nibiru, um, when is it that the Earth's orbit will cross that trail of debris? Well, it depends on the the speed at which this uh, planet is coming, or the system is coming into the inner parts of uh, the solar system. I've done some more study on this, and uh, you know, at the time when this uh, sign of Revelation 12 is fulfilled we are actually on the opposite side of the sun and Jupiter is on on the other side of the sun so that means when we do uh, half an orbit around the sun we would be at our closest approach to this uh, this collision in the the heavens so I'm not sure whether you know within six months we could or the the earth could already encounter some of the debris or you know that would be the first point that I would would see as a possibility for an encounter with some of the debris from that collision. Let, let's go uh, back to uh, September 23 uh, with the moon under f- under the feet. Um, and uh, uh, okay, so that completes the Revelation 12 picture. That's correct. With the stars at the head, uh, the birth of the uh, ma- uh, ch- man child, and the stars under the feet. Um, and then when uh, t- tell us about this uh, uh, bruising the heel and bruising the head tell us about that when do you think that will happen well Bonnie that will uh, according to what mm-hmm. I understand will happen at the birth of Jupiter from the Virgo constellation which happens around uh, September 9th well that's when Jupiter I see. exits okay. the womb of, of Virgo uh, and that you know if we put all the information together um, that describes a collision in the heavens or in our solar system between Jupiter and some foreign uh, entity or uh, you know a s- uh, entity within a system that passes Jupiter uh, we okay the head I, of I that know before you you linked this with um, uh, um, uh, the um, let me see uh, the, the 1260 the, days well the uh, the the um the, the asteroid that broke up, uh, Shoemaker Levy nine comet. Yeah, yeah. Shoemaker Levy, and oh, goodness, did it hit Jupiter? Did it hit Jupiter? Yes, it did. Um, I think it was okay. in 1994. Uh, it broke up, and then two years later, it actually okay. hit the um, the planet at the sort of around the bottom side of the the planet. Uh, they were 21 fragments, and they basically drew a dotted line on the bottom of the planet. If you if you look at the uh, some of the pictures that are available or images of Jupiter that are available out there, and I think some of the images that show this the best is infrared images, which show the heats that be, that has or that were generated as a result of those collisions, and it clearly shows like a dotted line on the bottom of Jupiter. Um, matching where the heel would be, and then also considering the fact that the comet had the name Shoemaker um, associated with it, was just mind blowing to me when I when I realized that um, you know this was basically a warning from God, showing us yes. where the the collision would impact Jupiter before That's it right. happens, and what Th- section of Jupiter would be removed during this collision. This is almost like a, a, a surgeon going in ahead of time and marking off where they will uh, make the incision with the with the with the pens. That's I mean, correct. this is like this is the section I'm going to take off at a at a future date um, in end times, 
And like you say, the shoemaker part, you know, okay, this is the foot that goes in the shoe. Uh, I'm drawing, uh, I'm making a shoe here uh, to show you the foot. This is kind of, like you said, it blew your mind, Jacob. That blows my mind. Yeah, and what, what was interesting is I've had some comments and questions about this collision where people uh, say to me that, you know, Jupiter is a gas giant, so don't be uh, concerned. They were, they, it's just, a, you know, a giant gas ball. <laughs> and there will be no debris or debris coming from this collision because it's just gas. And, you know, I've, I've got a science background and I understand how gas works with, uh, with Boyle's gas law. And, you know, it, it, it's similar to saying, you know, when you, f- you fill a balloon with helium, and you pop the balloon that you've got a a little helium ball in front of you that never happens it always disperses so that would be the same if you assumed that Jupiter was just a, a giant mass of, of gas uh, the only way in which in it would be possible to get <coughs> gas to accumulate in the form of a balloon when you pop the balloon is to have a gravity at the, you know or a, a source of gravity at the center of that gas to keep the gas together because the gas particles will always try to you know push each other uh, each other away and it'll just disperse into the void that surrounds Jupiter. So based on the fact that we have a sphere surrounded by gas uh, means that there is a substantial amount of uh, terra firma underneath what we can see on Jupiter, even though people say it's a gas giant and you know, 90% of what, what it has is, is made up of gas. I, I don't agree with that. Well, you know, when you look, I'm looking at the pictures of Shoemaker Levy, <clears throat> and it certainly looks like, uh, you know, bona fide impacts on a uh, on on a solid surface. So, uh, yeah, I wouldn't <laughs> I wouldn't trust that it's only gas. Oh well, yeah. uh, nothing to see here. I would not um, I wouldn't trust that either, Jacob. But thank you for that scientific explanation. <laughs> so, underneath all this gas is terra firma, and that will become fragmented. Yeah. Uh, okay, um, and it will be the top of Nibiru. Uh, are Jupiter and Nibiru about the same size? Uh, I have no idea, Bonnie. Um, when uh, Na- uh, NASA released the uh, statements, they said that you know it would either be four to eight Earth masses or similar size to Jupiter. Those that's the the, yeah. the only news or the only information that was ever released. And uh, I don't have a an infrared telescope, unfortunately, so <laughs> I can't verify that. <laughs> Let's start a GoFundMe for yeah. Jaco's uh, yeah. infrared telescope here. Was um, there not uh, uh, some speculation that that the debris would become falling stars? Uh, that is to say, like meteorites coming through the Earth's atmosphere uh, like, in like the, the period Trump- about three and a half months after the collision. Well, I, I would think that the possi- like I said, the, the possibility for an an encounter with the debris would be about six months after this collision, because then we would be at our close, or the first closest approach to Jupiter um, at that time. Um, then mm-hmm. we move further away again, you know, as we orbit the sun. Um, so it would the first encounter would be possible at about six months, I would say. Uh, and then after that, it would be a year and six months. And then after that, it could be at any time because it would have been distributed throughout the the central parts of the solar system, I would imagine. Okay, I was wondering if there was a connection there to the 1260 days. Um, but I've actually covered that in the... I think my f- latest video that I've that I've put on put out uh, it covers Jacob's trouble, uh, or the first part of it, and positioning some of the events that are described in in the Bible around this time frame. So I don't know if you've ever, or if you've if you've had time to to view that yet. And I know YouTube is also unsubscribing my my subscribers for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> it's quite interesting to see what what goes on in the world. Oh yes, that, that I want to suggest to the four of us then that nobody go driving uh, alone in the Arizona desert in the near future. <laughs> when you say time of Jacob's trouble in the in, in the video in the third video that you just put out, um, 
and, and if you want to access these videos, it's God's Roadmap to the End. God's Road Roadmap to the End. Um, <clears throat> and, and when you say Jacob's trouble, are you meaning, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, Daniel nine speaks of a seven seven year period. Are, are you refer referring to the whole thing, or as J the whole seven year period as the Jacob's trouble? Yes, I, I am, uh, Bonnie. I believe that <clears throat> okay. if we if we look at the maybe uh, what I should do. I don't think we've got a lot of. We've got about five minutes, I see. Um, no, no, we have until ten o'clock. I yeah, mean, well, okay. Until the next break. Right, yeah. But now, yeah, yeah, right for the next break. Yeah. So, um, what I'll do is I, I can maybe take you through some of the information that uh, will lead up to the uh, the September twenty third uh, in a maybe a, a short uh, introduction, I guess. Um, so uh, this is specifically referring to what we read in, in Matthew 24, verse 4 to 8, and Luke 21, verse uh, 8 to 11. And this is where Jesus' disciples came to him and asked him to tell them about the time of the end and what would be the sign of his coming, etc. And then the first thing that Jesus responded with was to <laughs> say, Take heed that no man deceive you, uh, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. So this is the, the first thing that, that Yeshua mentioned about the time of the end. It will start with deception. There will be people mm -hmm. that will come and say they are Christ. Uh, and then if we read this, these passages analytically, we see that he then says, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For these all these things must come to pass but the end is not yet. So, what he says when, uh, what he says here, in my opinion, is when we hear about the wars and the rumors of wars, these are, are aspects that will precede the uh, the actual start of the end, and uh, this is also then associated with the beginning of sorrows, which is associated with birth bangs, which is associated with the time period between November 20th and the birth of. Jupiter from Virgo. Um, so we've we've been given a very specific time frame within which the description that Jesus is giving us in Matthew 24 and in Luke 21 uh, will cover s certain events. And the first thing that w that it will start off with is is a war that uh, he de then describes as for nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. So, I'll continue after the break. <laughs> Absolutely, and that is a happy note because look up, our salvation draws nigh. Welcome back, everyone, to the last half hour with our special guest, Jaco Prinsloo. Uh, Jaco, um, you know, Ron um, uh, um, mentioned uh, a question. Do you want to repeat your question, Ron? Yeah, it, it, the passage that uh, Jacob was referring us to, uh, Matthew 24, where Messiah says, Take care that you be not deceived, for many will come saying, I am the Christ. There's no punctuation in the manuscripts that we have, and whether you punctuate that or not can change the meaning rather drastically. For example, if you put quotation marks around the, the phrase, I am the Christ, uh, that would mean that you have a, a sort of an antichrist figure, a pretender coming in pretending to be the Christ. But without any quotation marks, it can mean that many will come saying that Yeshua is the Christ. That is, it would be someone, the deceivers might come from within or without the church. Both are possible, depending on how you punctuate it. What, Jacob, what do you, what do you see there? Uh, f from my point of view, this is one of the difficult things to understand. You know, if you just read this specific passage on its own, it is difficult to, like you say, to understand what the the real meaning is that you get out of this. And this is where you need to draw in, in my opinion, all the other sections from God's Word to to get a picture uh, that starts making sense and where you can understand the the chronology of of what is being said here and how everything fits together. So if we look at what is said in Daniel 9, let me just go back to that passage again quickly. Um, I'll just want to, I just want to show you what, what my view is on this. Um, I think it's in Daniel 9:27. 
uh, where we see written, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. So this is right at the beginning of the final week of Daniel. We, we see uh, somebody referred to as he, uh, but there's not really a lot of information in this passage given to us to understand who the, the he is that is being referred to. And many people believe this is Messiah the Prince, and we also see in uh, Daniel 9, 25 and in 26 that we have Messiah the Prince being mentioned in Daniel 9 verse 25 and then there's also in Daniel 9, 26 where we see and the people of the Prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary so then we have to ask is this uh, Prince of the people uh, the same as Messiah the Prince and you know these these things were given to Daniel. It is it is sort of cryptic if we if we read it just uh, in isolation. But then if we if we go to two Thessalonians chapter two, um, let me just quickly get that. We we see that uh, before we go to two Thessalonians two, there's also in Daniel where we see that in the midst of the week the sacrifice and the bl- the oblation will be cut off or, or cease. And then if we read in 2 Thessalonians 2, we see that uh, this person who is described as the man of sin, or the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, uh, all that is worshipped, um, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So, in my opinion, the deception that Jesus is refer- referring to in Matthew 24 and in Luke 21 incorporates all of this information that we have to piece together to understand where the deception is coming from. So in the same chapter of 2 Thessalonians uh, or 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 um, we see the the same deception that that is mentioned uh, in Matthew 24 being described here uh, in, from verse 9 onwards we we see even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. So that's, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. So the deception that, that comes um, at the beginning of this period is, is, is a judgment from God over those who did not receive the truth and did not love the truth that they might be saved. Uh, and the f- I think you mentioned the, the conference uh, in Koinonia House, uh, and mm-hmm. Chuck Missler is really one of my favorite Bible study... Uh, in mind. Uh, yeah, I've, I've listened hours and hours and days to, to his teachings, and it's, it's really amazing what he's, what he's uh, discovered and, and shown me. Uh, Will you engineers keep together? Yeah. <laughs> so, in Matthew 24, we know that Matthew was written from uh, the perspective of painting Jesus as Israel's Messiah. And then when we read Luke, we know that he, the perspective that is given of Jesus is from a Gentile perspective. And it's also interesting when we compare these two passages where um, the, the period leading up to uh the beginning of the end is described, there are subtle differences between the two, which specifically applies to Israel and which do not apply to the Gentile nations. Um, Mm -hmm. And in this section, in Matthew 24, is the only uh, section where we see this period from the conception up to the birth known or being termed as the beginning of sorrows. In Luke, we don't see a name being given to this, we we only see mention or Jesus mentioning that the end is not by and by uh, when we read these or when we see these things happening. Um, also in Luke, we see a specific mention of the the great and fright or fearful signs in the heavens, which is left out in Matthew. So there's no reference in Matthew to the the heavenly signs, which means that Israel, as they as a nation, um, they failed to recognize the Messiah when he came the first time, um, while God gave them both prophecies and celestial signals to to mark the the specific times. The same situation will occur in the in the second instance when you know the the Gentile nations would be aware of the, the timing that was given to Israel for their Messiah's return, 
and and how all these things fit together so that that's in a nutshell what we see and then maybe just to quickly go over the the events that will happen in the the time period known as the beginning of sorrows we see that this would start off with a war and various nations rising against nations and i'm sure you'll agree with me that we are currently in a situation where that seem to be or seems to be possible you know more and more every day uh, yeah. But how exactly this will break out, I think we find in uh, Isaiah 21. Let me just quickly find that passage. Um, is it Isaiah? Yeah. Uh, where we once again see the same imagery being provided. We, uh, let me just read the passage. Maybe that's that's easier. So in Isaiah 21 verse 2, starting at verse 2, A grievous vision is declared unto me. The treacherous dealer dealeth treacherously, and the spoiler spoileth. Go up, O Elam, which represents Iran. Besiege, O Media, also Iran. All the, the sighing thereof have I made to seize. Therefore are my loins filled with pain. Pangs have taken hold upon me as the pangs of a woman that travaileth. I was b uh, bowed down at the hearing of it. I was dismayed at the seeing of it. My heart panted. Fearful, fearfulness affrighted me. The night of my pleasure hath, uh, hath he turned into fear into me. Um, so that's basically describing the same time period that we we see described in the Revelation 12 sign. Um, and let me just quickly see where. So, and we also see that. Iran is basically being called up to to attack, which uh, in a treacherous way as well, which would, in my opinion, um, show us that what will happen in this instance is that there will probably be a surprise attack f coming from Iran on Israel uh, around nov November 20th. Huh. But I will bring an oh. end to all the groaning she caused. What is that, Jaco? Uh, well, that will be, I suppose, the end at which Israel will be will recognize the the true Messiah, Yeshua, uh, at the time when they will <coughs> be fleeing from from Jerusalem, when uh, when the the rebuilt temple in which the Antichrist or the false Messiah will set him up to be worshipped by Israel. Uh, will be destroyed by a, a a huge earthquake as well as a flood which I discuss in the latest video that I've put out um, I don't know if you've, if you've had any opportunity to see that yet no I haven't I, a surprise attack by Iran on Israel around November 20th that, that's interesting in terms of American politics because uh, if the attack were to take place before the election uh that could upset the election, but if it takes place after, um, I think that could that could cause a situation of martial law where, you know, the current president would uh, refuse to leave office uh, under martial law and remain in office as a result of the, you know, the chaos that will erupt from a, a world war breaking out. Yes, reluctantly, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that that well, is entirely possible. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, there. I mean, have you seen that video where there is put out by Iran, uh, saying that at last we shall descend upon Jerusalem and uh, drive Israel into the sea? Have you? Have you? Um, I mean, it, it's an official video put out. By yeah, Iran. I'm, I'm sure. Well, and we remember that the uh, the last satellite that they launched had inscribed on its side in Hebrew uh, Israel must be wiped off the map but that's just right out of uh, what Psalm 83 wow yeah, isn't it yeah uh, uh, um, uh, oh okay well that would certainly you know take a rereading of this of this section uh, in light of that uh, in light of the, the fact that this is uh, Iran um, you know here we have uh, um, uh, the Great Red Dragon, or Nibiru Planet X, attacking Melik Melik Sedek, um, uh, uh, Jupiter, 
uh, and in, then on, on the earth we have the attacks upon Israel uh, to correspond with uh, everything happening in concert here. Um, you know, before we go, and we only have like, whew, uh, you know, 16 minutes here or less, 12 minutes, I wanted to go to, uh, you know, link um, the trumpets uh, with 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 what we're talking about in the heavens, Jaco. Here we have the birth of the uh, of the child, the birth of uh, of uh, uh, Yeshua's final kingdom, which you know, as Maria brought up, you know, could represent the whole uh, uh, enlarged kingdom of Israel. Um, uh, as prophesied, then all of Israel shall be saved. The the Gentiles, the the the, the Yeshua believers, the Jews, the and and everybody else. I mean, just the whole thing. Um, the two sticks made into one. The, the two sticks made into one of Ezekiel, absolutely. But let's just you know, let me read this: the first, second, third, fourth. Uh, my my goodness, the fifth trumpet, and you know, and and uh, and how does this? What is the nexus between the trumpets and uh, 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 what you're talking about in the heavens? The first angel sounded his trumpet. There came hail, fire mixed with blood. It was hurled down upon the earth third of the green things were burned up then came the second trumpet something like a huge mountain all ablaze was thrown into the sea a third of the sea was destroyed and the third angel sounded his trumpet a great star blazing like a torch uh, came into the water and it became bitter wormwood a fourth angel sounded his trumpet a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, a third of the stars, so that it was without light. Then the fifth trumpet, I saw that a star had fallen from the earth and it had opened the abyss. And then out comes all that. Um, uh, so is there is there a nexus? First of all, not assuming a nexus, but is there a nexus between the trumpets? Which certainly sounds like asteroids uh, uh, coming onto earth and and what we're talking about uh, Jaco the explosions you know uh, the the heel of of of, of Medic being blown off uh, by this and and you know maybe the maybe the the, the, the top of, um, of, uh, of Planet X, Nibiru, uh, plus this thing coming through, coming through the asteroid belt, it already, we know, has a tail of its own. Uh, what's the nexus, uh, or if any, Jaco? Yes, I, I agree completely, Bonnie. And one of the studies that I did lately was to see whether the, uh, you know, the flood that was mentioned in both Daniel and in Revelation with which the Jerusalem and the sanctuary is destroyed as part of the of Daniel's prophecy that we see in Daniel 9 whether that is an actual or an actual or a physical flood and not you know in many instances the bible uh, symbolizes armies as floods and i wanted to find out is this a physical flood uh, you know water a mass of water that will be wiping away Jerusalem and uh, the sanctuary and I, I have discovered that uh, the Bible is indeed talking about that, um, specifically when we consider what we see in Revelation 12 with um, the crevice that is, or the, the earth opening its mouth to swallow up the flood that will be pursuing the, you know, the fleeing remnant that will be fed in the mountains for the final half of the, the week. Um, so what I, what I set out to find out was to see if I could find uh, the Bible confirming a literal interpretation of a flood that would be destroying Jerusalem and uh, the temple, or the rebuilt temple. And if we look at... Um, uh, I've now suddenly got a blank on where exactly I found it, but... <laughs> let me, Father, let me, Father, bring it to Jacob's yeah, mind. <laughs> yeah, let me, but it's it's basically the Mount of Olives. When uh, when Jesus' feet touch down on the Mount of Olives, we see that uh, it mentions that Zechariah. Uh, yeah, Zechariah. That's it. Let me just find a specific passage. I can't remember. Zechariah fourteen. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so so the body of of Christ worked together. <laughs> so and yeah. And, uh, <laughs> 
Ze- Zechariah 14 verse 4 and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives which is before Jerusalem on the east and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof towards the east and towards the west and there shall be a great valley and half the mountain shall remove toward the north and half toward the south and if you look at exactly where the Mount of Olives is situated uh, in relation to where the Temple Mount is it's, it's exactly east which means that this mouth of the earth that will open up will actually split the temple mount in two if you if you consider this information um, and this will happen right at the the midpoint when the sacrifices will be ceased uh, when the antichrist will set himself up in the temple of god to be worshipped at as god and we jesus uh, tells the remnant of israel when they see this happening they should flee mm-hmm. into the mountains to avoid the okay. massive tsunami that mm-hmm. will be that will be coming but that will also drain into this huge crevice that will form as a result of a uh, an asteroid impact. The, the only the only uh, reasonable explanation that would combine a huge crevice forming in the crust of the Earth that is combined with a massive tsunami that will be associated with that would be an asteroid impact within an ocean somewhere um, that is so powerful that it will actually penetrate the crust of the earth splitting it open um, in the process and considering the the amounts of seawater that will flow into this crack and come into contact with the molten insides of the earth the the explosive and destructive force that will come from this event will be unimaginable and I I believe this also matches the the trumpet judgment where we see the locusts um, coming out of the earth when the key to the bottomless pit was given to one of the stars that would basically split the earth open which I think it's it's quite a fascinating fascinating yeah that's correct a star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss and smoke rose it from a gigantic furnace. Oh, smoke rose. Is is that the seawater hitting the molten core? Yeah, if you consider uh, bringing seawater into, or, you know, any uh, amount of water into contact with, uh, you know, a molten or the temperatures that you would find on the insides of the earth, that would be an explos- explosion that you would you you wouldn't be able to imagine. I would think the you know half of the Earth would probably blow away um, as part of the you know this explosion that would occur as a result of that. Um, it, so it's, his feet touching the Mount of Olives then could be the what is struck off from the heel of the planet. Oh, metaxetic, yeah. Yeah, I think from what Ooh. from what I've discovered in this study is that uh, Yeshua returns at the midpoint of this week of Daniel, uh, and this is when he will then tread the wine press on his own. You know, with these armies that will that will be fighting against the the wicked that remain on the earth, while Israel is or the remnant of Israel is protected and nourished for a thousand two hundred and sixty days in their place that that is prepared for them. Those, those armies could be falling stars. I I think they would be angelic beings or mm-hmm. demonic beings or whatever the case may be. Especially the the ones with scorpion tails that are described in oh, yeah. Revelation. Those, yeah, they are very. No, the, those the armies are... that accompany Messiah. Yeah. Well. To fight. well, there's much to speculate. Yes. <laughs> there's a lot. Wow. Do you think? Do you think in your studies, Jaco? You know, it says. I mean, it's calling these trumpets, which is very interesting. Do you think that this will happen on each, on each trumpet? And there are seven of them. Do you think that this will occur on each Yom Teruah or Feast of Trumpets during the final week, the final seven-year period uh-huh. of this Earth? Um, I'm not sure, Bonnie, but I, I don't think it will happen like that because there's simply not enough time for, for all of this to to take place within a seven year period I would think because uh, there will definitely not be uh, any debris available for the first Feast of Trumpets um, so you know based on that I, I, can't, I can't say that that would be a, a likely scenario okay all right um, well we certainly have some uh, um, you know, interesting <coughs> geologic and, and and theologic um, events, and 
astrologic. Well, let me see. Astronomic. <laughs> Astronomic yeah. Astronomic. <laughs> Astronomically, <laughs> that's right. Not astrologic. No, 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 no. That's, There's um, no yeah. logic in astrology. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that needs to be given uh, a, a different name. Um, uh, but uh, we certainly have some interesting times to look at. Uh, forward to. You know, Jacob, we have about five minutes. This is a, a complicated, and I know that, you know, we haven't covered everything, but to go uh, from uh, the the conception of Melik Tzedek, uh this November uh, into the fruition of the trumpets in Revelation, uh, you know, this is, th- that's quite mind-blowing. Yes, it definitely is, uh, and I think you know the world are, are very uh, ignorant of this at this point. You know, nobody believes it. And you, uh, I certainly get a lot of people that are scoffing at what what I say and what I do. But I mean, this is what the Lord is revealing to me, and I yeah. need to get it out. And whether people accept it or not is not my responsibility, or it's got nothing right. to do with me. But that that's is right. that's what I've yeah. been tasked to do, and that's what I'm doing my best to, to do uh, and I think you know if we see a, a war starting uh, between Israel and Iran uh, there's actually another passage in was it Zechariah 5 uh, which actually describes what the um, or how this war could break out and that is let me just quickly find it um, that's the fire in that's the the, f- um, the fire missile? in the missile, yeah. And yeah, the, this yeah. is wickedness, you know. And the fact that yes. this this uh, treacherous attack will happen during the uh, the labor pains uh, would also point the the linkage between the passage in Zechariah five with what we read in Isaiah twenty one, where Iran will probably launch a nuclear attack against Israel, and Israel might be able to to shoot it down before it reaches them and then retaliate and for that reason you know the the whole uh, middle east will erupt in uh, a war that breaks out and it'll pull in various other nations as well but yeah we'll probably have to see how this all pans out and but if we see this happening we can know with certainty that time is running out you know and those who who refuse to believe or who scoff at at god's word and his existence